we were on the beach a couple of hundred metres from where we are now and we know based on the records that we were standing in exactly the spot, you know, where the French had their interactions in the early 1790s. And to actually hear people talk about the physical impact that has on them, both in a positive sense in terms of actually being on this country and connecting with country and connecting with those old people, but also on the other hand, you've got this immense sorrow, <laughs> this absolute immense sorrow. And it can hit you at different times and yesterday was one of those moments where you would see people needing that solitude to actually take in that sense of immeasurable loss in terms of that knowledge and those stories and, and that connection to this particular place. You know, we see a lot of symbolic measures and gestures which are fantastic. I mean, this for me is not a symbolic gesture or measure. You know, there's a real opportunity to actually come up with a real difference for this country here. And that's why every little string of information that, that exists around you know, what happened here is really, really important to us in order to really inform again that, that healthy country plan going forward. So some really special connections that people were making and very significant to be down here. Well, this is one of these fantastic opportunities where you get to move away from all this thinking and planning that goes on behind the desk in the concrete jungle in the middle of a city where you actually get to break away with Aboriginal people to talk about healthy country on country. We're in a really privileged position to have a number of really culturally connected, skilled people within both Parks and Wildlife Service and Aboriginal Heritage Tasmania to come together here on country to talk about the health of this country that we're standing on today. So look, we've got different crews coming over with different organisations and we'll have lots of conversations, walking over country here, reading country, getting a better understanding of the history of the country and how special it is down here. And they're really trying to set a direction forward around, okay, well, here are the ideas. What's the plan look like? And where do we want to see this country, you know, in 10, 20, 30, 50 years time? Obviously the old people spent, you know, most of their life walking on country and reading country and learning from country. And in order for us to actually develop the skill sets and the knowledge to actually inform a healthy country plan, we need to spend more time on country. The first thing for me is getting as many Aboriginal people down here as possible. And of course, the more people you have involved in this process, the more knowledge you have, you know. Someone will always bring something else to the table that can inform the process. I noticed the power of those relationships and connections when we had a large mob of people come down yesterday and really powerful group conversations and again, different people being able to provide different knowledge and histories of the area that can all help inform the conversation and then breaking off into different areas and there was a point there yesterday where there were basically a large number of Aboriginal people scattered all the way around the peninsula here and there were some people diving and swimming and laughing there were others walking on country and talking there were others based around the fire and you could take a snapshot and you could go back you know 300 400 500 thousands of years and you could play out that scenario here so that for me is immensely powerful and that in itself will guide the development of the healthy country plan I'm really passionate about increasing the capabilities and the capacity of our Aboriginal staff and giving them skills that they can draw on. And I guess it's really important as Aboriginal staff that we educate non-Aboriginal people about how we think as Aboriginal land managers. So I thought well, this is a really good opportunity to try and change some of the culture that exists within government departments in how the management of lands approached. So it was not to go into this process and tell them that this is a better way. It's another way that complements the existing structure that we have now. And these two things, healthy country planning and contemporary land management sit side by side and they actually complement, they don't compete. So I think to me that was probably the underlying motivation for it. 
I had a look around the state and I thought, well, we're somewhere that's really important to Aboriginal people that has overarching management concerns or issues that really relate to us as Aboriginal people. The more I looked, the more research base stuck out for me. And it was for a few reasons, I suppose. One of them was because it's so famous with the French actually coming here and making that contact with the Lila Pony people. And because of the historical significance to non-Aboriginal people, I thought it was really important. And it's got all those contemporary management issues with the impact of tourism, the impact of visitor development, people actually living in the landscape full time now, impact of farming, fishing, forestry, and all those industries. So the bigger picture here is our country. And these things here are separate entities that are impacting on the country. So how do we, as Aboriginal people, consider the management of those for the benefit of that piece of country. You know, to us as Aboriginal people, land management's an intuitive thing. It's not a reactive thing. You know, we don't react to something that's happened because of something else. We intuitively manage to stop those things happening anyway. After reading a few and then learning the process, you start to realise doing a healthy country plan is really the best form of land management and being a better land manager, and in particular the best way for an Aboriginal person to interpret their knowledge and skills that's been passed on to them, or that they've learnt, and I guess put it on paper. It makes you look at country differently. It makes you look a little bit more in depth into it. It makes you rethink a few things and what you see as healthy may not actually be healthy. Water's gonna play an important role with the animals. You have a certain interests. Where you've got that interest, you find yourself leaning into the area with the Healthy Country Plan, which is good, because not everyone's interested in the same thing, which sort of spreads that knowledge and skills across the board. Healthy country, I think, means different things to different people depending on your culture and where you're from. I'm a saltwater Murray, I come from the ocean, so for me, I'm thinking about sea country and I'm thinking about how environments like this one can be improved, you know. How do we improve that habitat so that we're, we're getting to see some of those species come back, like abalone, crayfish, all the different kinds of shellfish, certain fish, right through to the birds and how they're interacting with that environment. Fire is a huge passion for me. Our landscape needs it. Needs it to breathe, it needs it to regenerate. Our animals need it. It's, it's a whole process that, that doesn't get taken into account through the management processes that are happening now. Fire is only used as a clean-up tool. It's not used the right way and it's only destroying the country that we have left. I just want to take in as much knowledge as I can to help support what we can do. And there was a comment made that getting the younger generation to come in, like I've got a few kids that I see in schools and I would love to bring them down on country and help heal the place. Today we've been sharing a bit of knowledge and figuring out how we're going to look after this land because it's sort of been a bit neglected, especially around fire. I've got grandkids and I want them to learn about not only their culture, but also the land and what it means. It's about education, educating people, not just about you know, what happened in the past and not about what's happening now, but we've also got to look to trying to educate people how to look after things for the future. I get the sense of loss here, whether it be from our ancestors, what they went through, to just a loss of resources and the beauty of the place. I mean, we're in a beautiful spot right now, but you go on the other side of that hill and it's not as nice, it's just not healthy. And I'd like not to get that. So maybe one day, if we implement a lot of these healthy country plans and write them and then make sure they're followed through, maybe one day it will be healthy again and back to what it should be. So the picture would be, there'd be lots of the sort of choked up trees taken out, all the underlay would be gone. You'd have bigger mother trees to be able to protect all the little ones. You'd have open grass plains and then you'd have the, the button grass plains would be nice and healthy and thick. You'd have lots more animals running around and then it, then it creates that cycle of managing itself. Like if we take away animals, if we take away certain plants or we bring in different management directions, it has effect on the whole. 
this process to us is about developing a strategic plan of action where people understand that these are our values, this is what's important, and how about involving us at the start when these decisions are starting to be discussed before the decisions are made. As Aboriginal people involved in this, it's about empowerment. You know, we're empowering ourselves, we're empowering our country, but through this process, my ultimate aim is to empower the people that we work with in parks to come on this journey with us. Because if we don't bring our non-Aboriginal colleagues along on this journey with us, it's going to fall over before it's even begun. So if we can come out of this and develop those key products of building our knowledge and increasing our capacity and taking people on this journey with us and create an opportunity for this to roll out into other areas of the island and other areas of parks managed land, then to me, I think we've embedded something that's going to be a true success. Anytime us fellas get on country, meaning us Aboriginal fellas being together is the best thing that any of us could do, I think. It's like being with your family, really. And then us being on country where we are, you know, it's unmatched really. So here we are, you know, I could say day three, essentially, and, you know, we're jamming at the bit. For me, I've had my shoes off now, you know, continuously for, for three days. I feel that I've connected with this country and place, and then there's a process that we go through where we're going to leave this place, you know, essentially this afternoon, and, and for me, it's a natural grieving process, you know, that we go through, and had we had more time, if we'd be straight in there and, and getting stuff done. I like to look at, well, how can we harness that energy and that motivation and that momentum to ensure that it doesn't get lost? Even though we're going back to the concrete jungle and we're going back to our desks and we're going back to our busy lifestyles and our families and all the colours and textures and everything that goes with it, um, how do we keep this process going? Because this land is always here. This land will always need Aboriginal knowledge. It will always need Aboriginal management. And we've got the knowledge and experience and the motivation to make it happen.